You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did you'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now, 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. As a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers. People who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today. The following program contains coarse language and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised.
to welcome everyone to another episode of He Said, She Said. I am your host, Aggie, and with me tonight is none other than our beloved producer, Rick. How are you doing this evening? Beloved? I should have worn my boots. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm nice, damn it. <laughs> now, you sound like, now you sound like Sam and, and Angie both. <laughs> <laughs> Although Angie's the first one to tell you she's not actually nice. She's just Southern, so it comes across as nice, even though she's not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm what my mom calls um, piqua. And that, that, be, that means, you know, a little spicy. And I'm like, and she always meant it, like, as a joke, because I wasn't. <laughs> um, and now she's starting to find out that her prophecy has become true. <laughs> yeah. It's your fault, Mom. You called me this for years. I'm only living up to what you said I should be. Oh, no, I'm I'm not even kidding. Apparently, she was being really salty with all of us because we were not calling often enough. So I called, and I talked to my mom, and, you know, inquiring about stuff that's going on. You know, I she's the type of person, if you ask about somebody, she'll spend 20 minutes telling you exactly what's going on with that person, right? So, like, around... 30, 40 minutes in, you know, she said, do you want to talk to your dad? I said, no. And she was like, what? I said, no, no, you get your own phone call. I will call dad in a couple of days and he gets his own phone call. So from now on, you guys are going to get two calls a week, one for you and one for dad. And she was just flabbergasted because (laughs) I was going to split the calls. So that my dad wouldn't feel like, oh, I'm an afterthought because you call your mom and then she just gives me the phone. And that way my dad feels good about the phone call and my mom gets her own phone call. So everybody's happy. And she's like, I can't believe you're doing that. And I'm like, it's my dime. She's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so she did. She called me that and, and, that, and she said, and I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's not hurting my feelings, mom. <laughs> so, so, yeah, her prophecy has has come to fruition. I don't think she likes it. <laughs> you know she's going to blame me for that, right? Oh, no, no, no. She's, she's blaming my sisters where the blame lies, and that's okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. No, eventually it'll come back around to me because you came out of your shell after you started doing podcasting. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, they they think this is just a hobby and that I talk about needlepoint and the weather and that's about it. <laughs> they don't understand the concept of podcasts. Dad honestly just thinks that we just do shows like the ones we do at Christmas. <laughs> and <laughs> he thinks I do that. All the time. Well, it's good because if, if your dad knew what we actually talked about, he'd probably try to kill me. Well, he always said that I had a talent for voice acting, and he thought that I should have done that. And and, and I was like, yeah, no, I I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. Because could. I would have to immerse myself in somebody's somebody else's character and squel squelch mine, and it's very difficult for me to do that. Now, there are some people that do it. Um, uh, one of uh, several of my followers are actually voice uh, uh, actors, and they actually do uh, the audio for books. You know, um, I think some people follow her, Uppity Hobbit. Uh, she does that, and um, um, my friend Adam XP is also getting into uh, voice acting. So, uh, and he he has a ridiculously smooth voice, and I'm like, where? Why haven't you done this? You you know he's he's actually in a podcast called Mishmash Men, and I, I I kept pushing him into doing this, and his wife did too. You know we both pretty much would push him and yell at him together and everything. You got to do this, you got to do this. So he's finally taking the plunge on that. But um, you know so, but I for me I'd be like it would be tough to separate my myself from the character. It, so, because I'm not a very good actress. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think you with, with as, as gung ho as you get on Halloween costumes and everything else, I think you'd be a lot better at it than you realize. <laughs> I would be like a method actor. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's better to be a, it's better to be a method actor than a method actor. If you know what I mean. 
Uh, yeah, I I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this has been a trippy week. There's been a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, as the title of the show says, the the the. The FAFOing is intensifying. <laughs> it has. There's been a lot of FAFO going on this week, um, and and it and it's amazing because uh, a lot of it is going, you know, around the world and um, with this administration, with the border crisis and everything. But a lot of people are not paying attention to what's happening in California, <laughs> which to me is is one of the best. FAFOs I've seen in a long time and specifically for the city of San Francisco I just I mean honestly it's it's almost as if they're running out of shovel shovels to dig their way to China that's they just keep digging and I well, I don't understand they, they don't have to dig anymore they invited him to come there remember <laughs> well yeah I mean that that used to be a beautiful city. My sister used to go to San Francisco for um, a lot of her work conferences. The DOD would host them out there. Um, and uh, she would go and uh, she loved Fisherman's Wharf. She loved going. I mean, one of her best experiences was going to Ghirardelli Chocolate. And because I pushed her into going, she wasn't going to go because she's not a chocolate person. But I told her, I said, you, you need to at least go and see if you can tour the factory and see how it's, I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to eat it. Just go look at it. And uh, she's hooked for life now. I mean, she prefers the bitter rather than the sweet. So she likes the dark chocolate. But, um, you know, just walking around the area, it used to be that you could walk around safely and everything was clean. Everything was great. And this was just 13 years ago. This was in 2010. And she went back about, I want to say about three, three and a half years ago. She left her hotel room and went right back inside. She was like, I, I can't walk outside. I don't feel safe. Um, and she was staying at a really ritzy hotel, if I recall correctly. She just didn't feel safe. She she felt like any minute somebody might accost her might fling something at her. She witnessed there was excrement. There were needles. There were condoms. Every every single, you know, stereotypical thing that you have come to associate with San Francisco um, sidewalks, it was there. And she was like, I, I thought people were making this up. Uh, I told her, no, this, this was not a talking point. This was, we were not making any of this up. And... When she came back into the hotel, the concierge asked her how, you know, if everything was okay, because he saw her leave and she came right back. He, he thought that she had forgotten something. And she said, I just, I, it is, I, I can't be out there. It's so, it's so dirty and everything. And they said, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. And he reaches in and gave, gave her a poop map. Remember those? The poop maps? They actually yeah, had those. Yeah, I, I, I remember those. And he said, these are the areas to avoid. And she looks at him and says, it's literally outside. And he was like, oh, we'll clean that up. And I, it's just like, you're not, you're not grasping the problem, okay? It's not that you have to go out there and clean it up. It's that it's being allowed to happen. And that's uh, endemic of San Francisco. They not only allow it to happen, they actually incentivize it. So as a result, someone put out, I think it was End Wokeness, put out a graphic of all of the stores that have shut down and left San Francisco. And it is enormous. It, the, I mean, I thought it was just five or ten stores. No. Oh, no. <laughs> it was not. This is, and this is on top of the brain drain that has been going on for the past, what, four years from California, just all of these tech companies uh, that have just completely moved. But it's not just tech companies. You know, there are media subsidiaries of other empires. There's um, uh, restaurants. There's, um, you know, just publishers, all sorts of, I mean, it's not just Tesla and SpaceX that moved out of California. 
I was telling Rick earlier that Gordon Ramsay, North America, moved out of California to Texas. And I'm like, why didn't I hear of this? <laughs> I love Gordon Ramsay. I'm just waiting for Gordon to learn how to stay, say, yeah. <laughs> But he moved everything, North America, over to Texas. It, they just couldn't take the... Uh, the abusive relationship that businesses have with the government out there. But yeah, San Francisco is the number one drain. I mean, they have suffered more losses, not just in the in tech and media and uh, restaurant, you know, entertainment divisions, but also in commercial. So many stores well, that have. So, wow. so, so just to give some people some math to kind of give them a way to wrap their head around this, in Q1 of 2020, the vacancy rate in San Francisco for, like, business headquarters and stuff was 4.1%. As of the uh, Q1 of 2023, their San Francisco office space vacancy rate ballooned to 29.5%. Oh, my word. So what you're saying, in essence, and this is this is probably the way somebody in San Francisco's mind is working. Hey, now we know where to put the homeless. <laughs> well, I mean, they might as well you do something if it hasn't happened yet. But yeah, so apparently from 2020 until Q1 of 2023, a total of 53 corporate co uh, companies have left San Francisco altogether. That's not. That's, I mean, that's not even counting the little places like the. There's a I, I saw an article earlier about a bookstore that was really popular in San Francisco that was kind of like a, a regional thing, and it, it's gone after 40 years. Um, and I guess it was a book short bookstore called Crops. Um, it was a used bookstore had been around for over 40 years, changed ownership once, maybe twice, and then just the doors just closed because they just. It, nobody was coming in because everybody was afraid to go outside. <laughs> I mean, it's just it it has become a feral jungle out there, and and a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, the, I, I, everybody was like, "Wow, Nordstrom, North for Nordstrom to actually shut its doors in San Francisco, it's a big thing because that's a flagship store for those of us." that do not do a lot of shopping like me. A flagship store is basically the premier store, the first store that opens. And that's where it, it's usually the biggest one. Um, most of these stores are recognized as being um, you know, tourist attractions because they are the flagship stores. Uh, I remember people would go from my hometown to Dallas to see Joskies. Okay, remember when Joskies was around? Yeah. Yeah, because that was the flagship store. And it was huge. It was a huge department store. Um, and so, you know, people go, same reason. They go to New York, they go to see Macy's. That is where their flagship store is located. So Nordstrom's flagship store, they actually have two, because two were opened at the same, roughly the same time. But the major one was in San Francisco. And they finally said, we cannot guarantee the safety of our employees because of the high rate of theft that was going on. And because of the laws in San Francisco, they, employees were prevented from stopping any loss prevention. So they had, you know, they if they were assaulted in the middle of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an ongoing theft of, of uh, clothing or, you know, whatever goods they had in that particular department, they couldn't fight back. So Nordstrom said, the rate of theft is too high. We are losing way too much money. We cannot guarantee our employees' safety. We're shutting our doors. Nancy Pelosi freaks out because that's where she shops. And she's like, oh, you can't do that. Nordstrom's looked at her and said, watch us. And they did. They just shut their doors. They shipped everything out. They helped to relocate some of their employees. 
And those that did not want to leave the area, they, they gave them a, a nice severance package and everything. But that was all they could do. They could not keep operating there. But that's, you know, that's one of like two or three that you hear about. Then you come to find out it's a lot more than that. Everybody knows CVS closed its doors, but not just in San Francisco, all over the place. They're just like done. Yeah, uh, Walgreens is now not even in, uh, is no longer in California. They pulled out of California completely. And Newsom said, yeah, we don't need you here. We have plenty of pharmacies. We don't need Walgreens. Uh, you're, and, he's gonna need uh, them. Though. I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Their policies are killing small businesses, though. So I mean, yeah. And you know, major hotel chains like the Hilton hotel chain closed several um, big conference hotels in San Francisco because they couldn't deal with it anymore. Um, well, Macy's is gone. Well, so it's a common, uh, it's a combination of that, and it's also the fact that, and this is kind of one of those unintended consequences things because you know they they let people burn shit down and you know destroy buildings through most of you know the the Biden or Obama administration, and then again in 2020, all the insurance companies are leaving California, so it's making it impossible for anybody to get insurance to be able to run businesses or even for their homes because the, the insurance companies are oh, like, no, yeah. this is where out. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, Gordy has even more insight on it, considering he's stuck there for now. He still needs um, to leave. Yeah, he needs to come over here. Look, free room and board. You, That's you, all I'm saying. You need to leave before we finish the wall, because when we finish the wall, it's going <laughs> to take a right and keep going until it hits Canada, bro. Just saying. Yeah, so, you know, it's just, it amazed me because there were some stores in there that I honestly did not think would close in San Francisco because they have been very supportive of the homeless population and they do vote in regards to the homeless population. They vote very progressively, you know, and those, you know, companies to include anthropology, uh, Whole Foods, I believe, um, it's gone to from that area. Um, just different places like that, that you expect, well, we, we support what they're doing Oh, no, now we don't, so we're leaving. That's basically how it's been. They didn't fight the city and their, you know, their, the city ordinances and their requirements, you know, to operate in there. And instead they went along with it thinking that this would help the situation. And I'm like, everybody forgets the one element every time that you enact a law or you pass a city ordinance or you do anything like that. Two words, human nature. No, if you're going to facilitate a bad habit, guess what? The habit's going to grow. It's not going to go away. I so mean, Anybody who's ever raised a kid knows this, though. <laughs> I don't understand why it's so hard for the government to figure out. Because yeah, this is, you know, instead of supplying, you know, methadone or clinics to, you know, to help you with rehab and quitting and everything. No, they're giving away needles and crack pipes and tell you this is where you can go smoke and, and, and be, you know, safe to do your drug habit. I'm like, no, you don't do that. <laughs> You're just incentivizing the problem. Well, this is, this is the exact opposite of human nature, though, because w we do better when we struggle. I mean, that, that's, exactly. how, that's how innovation happens. That's how things are figured out. This whole making everybody safe thing, all that does is build complacency. And with complacency, you atrophy because you're not having to work for anything anymore. And I, I understand that there, there but, but I firmly believe that this is ju just about like the whole, you know, uh, the whole mutation thing that they've turned into this whole transgender movement, which is probably about 0.01% of the population. I do believe that there is a small group that is more comfortable being homeless because they don't have any responsibilities. They don't have to worry about anything. All they've got to do is hustle to make sure they get food or whatever they need for the day. And that's just how they want to live. I mean, I know this because I've talked to people when I was one. I mean, I used to be people that would just go up when I was going back and forth to work and see people, you know, at Seven Eleven or whatever and be like, Hey man, here's five bucks. And then, then I talked to them for a minute. I'm like, okay, so, so, so what, what is, what is going on here? What is, what is stopping you from, 
being able to have what everybody considers the American dream. And, and without a doubt, every, and the ones that I would talk to for, for, I mean, not everybody, but at least a good five or ten out of a hundred that I spoke to when I was doing that kind of stuff were like, man, we like it this way. But we don't have to go punch a time clock. We don't have to do this. We don't have to do that. I don't have to worry about whether I can afford to pay my bills. I don't have to worry about keeping up with the Joneses. I just get to go what I want and do what I want. So I do think we're always going to have that. Because that's never going to go away. That's That's been a part of our culture for as long as we've had a culture. Uh, that's why we had the whole vagabond things, the carpet baggers, all of the above. It's just people that just, you know, didn't like to conform. That that's But this whole idea of making all these people that are stuck at the bottom as comfortable as possible so they never want to get back off the bottom is just dumb. It's suicidal, and it's killing California. Right now we're just talking about S- San Francisco. I mean, one of the first one of the first real indications for me where I knew California was in big trouble was when the biggest Christian radio network in the country moved everything lock, stock, and barrel to Tennessee. They just up and moved. They were done. They 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 have bought up pretty much every mom and pop Christian radio station in the country, and now they're they're they basically they they run two. One of them's called Air One, and for some reason the name of the other one is escaping me right now. Um, but they moved to Tennessee, and they did it, I believe it was sometime in 2020, because I think it was right before everything went into lockdown. And they've been there ever since. And it's just, it, when, you, when you've lost the Christians. Yeah. But I'm just saying, when you've, when you've lost the Christians, the ones that were probably out there trying to take care of your homeless every single day, because those are the people that live it. And they're like, nope, we're out. We can't do this anymore. And it's because of all of the restrictive business practices. Now, keeping in line with the whole fuck around and find out thing, New York's about to find out the hard way. Because there are a lot of big whale type people that have been trying to move into the space that Donald Trump left when he went down to Florida. And oh, yeah. now they don't want, to, don't want nothing to do with New York anymore. No, they're having um, a crisis as well in New York. People, you know, place, places are shutting up. And it was funny because during the lockdowns, a lot of um, places decided to just shut their doors and move out of the city to another part of the state, but eventually out of the state altogether to another state. And I had, you know, there was a, he was a former priest, Jonathan Morris. He did a lot of religious stuff for Fox and everything. And he was talking about that, you know, after the pandemic, that New York City was going to revive and come back and everything. And I'm like, no, it's not. Because once the people that moved out and went to a different state and figured out, hey, my tax burden here is a lot less than over there. And the weather's nicer. And the people are friendlier. And I have a place to park my car. You know, Pippi, you know, they started adding up all these things thinking, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go back to New York. And as a matter of fact, I was talking to my, my cousin who does live there. Um, she was actually telling me that in one of the areas where she um, she's a social worker uh, that she goes to and everything, those stores that shut down in 2020, they haven't opened back up. There's nobody to rent those places. So, you know, who knows? I I don't think that uh well, I don't I don't think that people would go back to New York if they once they tasted freedom outside of it. Well, so I mean in, in the same I mean the same thing is happening in New York and the same thing is happening in California. Those are the two biggest leftist laboratories in the country. And everything that those two states have tried to do that they swore was going to make everybody's life better has made it all worse. I mean, I'm looking at a headline from a story right now, and this is from MoneyWise, 14 hours ago. We're leaving. Rich Americans are ditching California and taking their tax dollars with them. So now California is starving for tax dollars. So if these people aren't going to Cal- aren't going to stay in California, then where are they going to go? Um, most of them are going to places like Texas, Florida, Arizona, and Tennessee. I mean, this is going to run into the same problem that the French had. Because you remember before the French wised up, they decided they were going to have like a 77% top tax rate. And then all the rich people left France. Yes. 
California, yeah. California and New York are about to have that same problem. And what's even worse is even with the high taxes in New York, because it is such a high value target for business, there were people that still wanted to do business there until this most recent verdict with Donald Trump, because everybody that's ever done real estate knows that he's getting in trouble for things that everybody else has done. And up until now, it's been OK. And now it's not. So everybody that's done business that way is like, nope. Put the, I, mean, I, I read an article um, from, I don't remember who it was. It was one of the Shark Tank guys, but it wasn't the bald guy. I don't remember which one it was. Um, wasn't the liberal asshole that pisses me off either, but I can't think of his name. But he's like, nope, pencils down. We're done. New York's dead to me. And he's like, I've been trying to get in. I've been trying to get in there and take over that market for 40 years and thought I'd have a good shot. Now that Trump was moving a lot of his businesses and his corporate headquarters and stuff to Florida. He's like, pencils down, we're done. I, I, they're, just, they're, they're slowly killing everything. And what's worse is when California and New York go, other places are going to follow. Because the, the thing that, that irritates me about the left when, with this whole fuck around and find out thing, they love to fuck around. They never seem to find out. They just move and start the same process over again. And it's annoying. Yeah. I, I'm still remembering the whole French thing. I thought it was so funny because uh, so many big French people came, uh, moved out, like big names. Yeah, Gerard, uh, Gerard Depardieu was the one that I remember because he's like, "Fuck that y'all, one." I'll that leave one it. was the funniest one. He's like, "Fuck I mean, y'all, I'll he, leave it. he basically told them to fuck off, and then the French went after him, saying, "Okay, well, we're going to make a retroactive law." And this law was so specific, it was made just to target him. <laughs> and, you know, meanwhile, he's over, I think he was in, he was in uh, Switzerland. He moved to Switzerland or something like that at the time. And he said, I'd like to see you try passing that one law that will only affect me when I don't live in your country anymore. <laughs> it was like, and he, you know, he surrendered to his he was at the point of surrendering his citizenship. I'm not sure if he actually, if he actually went through with it, but he wasn't the only one. There were several uh, Formula One and Grand Prix people that were very famous that hailed from France. Um, you know, they decided, fuck this, we're out. Um, some of them moved back to Italy. Italy was like, woohoo, they'll pay taxes here from now on. And they, they were smart. Italy was smart. When they came back, they said, for the first two years of you living here, you get a tax break, but that means you have to live here for 10. And they were willing to do that because even staying there for the whole 10 years and paying taxes on those eight years, they were still paying less in taxes than had they stayed in France for the next three. That's how bad it got in France. So, you know, they were like, oh, so we get a tax break for two years and we pay less in the rest, you know, for the next eight. Yeah. Oh, okay. And we get better food. <laughs> yeah. it, it was like, it was like a, a super big boon. Italy was, was not dumb. Dude. So, uh, I would absolutely love to live in Italy just for the food alone. I'm just saying. I cannot stress enough how wonderful that food is, but I'm, I'm not going to lie. When I went to Crete, that was one of my things to do before I die. I had to seek Gnosis. And so we went to uh, Crete, and uh, I toured it all. I got to see the Knossos Museum, Knossos Palace, the gypsum throne. I got to see the whole thing. I was like in heaven. The food was amazing. I cannot, I cannot even stress to you how awesome that food was. And it all came from the equivalent of, you know, somebody's, you know, the, the tamale in the back of the trunk of the car. It was like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. It was awesome. But yeah, Italian food. Mm. Ah, I hate Lent. Anyway, <laughs> oh my God, uh, you know it was oh, my fault. No. I brought up food. <laughs> I didn't buy. Don't get me wrong. I did not buy a pound of shallots, or as Curtis Stone and the Australians say, shallots. I did not buy a pound. It's just that that was the price sticker. I only needed one, and it was like a few ounces, if, if, you know, not even an ounce. Um, but the the thing was, I could buy like five or six 
for the same price that I paid for this one just in 2016. And it's just, it's amazing. And Paul Krugman is out there telling me, no, but that didn't happen. So speaking of fucking around and finding out, what if I told you that Disney was starting to send jobs out of California? I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised at all. But, 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 but again, you, shouldn't they that have be their somebody. mecca, though? <laughs> I don't understand. Why are you leaving? That's, California this has is, everything This is going to be do. very difficult for Disney um, because you're right. Disneyland is their flagship. Even though Walt Disney World is the is the bigger of the two, and it has more stuff, and you know it, they fully own like a third of Florida, it seems like Disneyland is their flagship. That's theirs, and people come from all over the world to see this. As a matter of fact, I know people that were they worked at the Euro Disney, who whose lifelong dream was to go to Disneyland. These people literally worked. They were, I mean, and when I say worked, they weren't like like I was, a little peon. We're talking like heads of the certain divisions for each section of uh, Euro Disney. You know, like higher-ups, you know. Like, you know. And um, their dream was to come to Disneyland. Not Disney World, Disneyland. Because that... That's the fact. That was the dream. That was the first one, and it is where the magic resides for a lot of people. And um, I, I, I don't know if they ever made it there, but you know, my girlfriend who grew up in Torrance, California, and she, she says her parents are getting ready to leave. They, they cannot take it anymore. And she's like, you know, I'm, I'm. She's like praying, hoping. She lives in Pennsylvania now, and there she and her husband already picked out a house for them and everything. So, but the problem is selling the house. <laughs> That's going to be a big hurdle because nobody's nobody's buying houses right now in that area. So, so we're hoping and praying. But yeah, that's another that's another issue. the The drain isn't just businesses i mean people are leaving in droves california has lost a lot of people um the outflux is just tremendous and it might affect them in um you know in the house of representatives because it's so bad well well and that's part of the reason why joe biden was fighting so hard to make sure all the illegals got counted into the census because that's a way to keep that's the way to keep the balances, the the, bal- the scales balanced, um, which is why Trump was fighting so hard to have them not count because they technically shouldn't be counted, in my opinion. But what do I know? Anyway, so this is from the L.A. Times a year ago. California's population is on the decline and high income earners have joined the exodus. Um, it turns out high income people are also fleeing the state. A new twist in the California exit, which, if you remember, just a few short months ago, Gavin Newsom said didn't exist during his debate with Ron DeSantis. Yeah, yeah, amazing, isn't it? You know, and, and and that's another thing that has always. I mean, I it still bothers me that he had a debate with DeSantis, and I'm like, dude, you are not running, you are not running, or are you running? And I think they're about to try to swap him in at the at the convention. I don't think it's going to go over well, and I don't think it's actually going to happen. But I think that's I think that's one of the things that they've been testing, though, because I think they really were trying to put. Mike or Michelle or whatever you want to call him, um, and it said it said no, <clears throat> so they were trying to look for another yeah. plan. Because <clears throat> I mean, look, if if Biden wins this time, it's going to be rather apparent there was a fix, and it's going to push us into civil war. Because with everything that's come out already, that we now are starting to see in all these places where they were shutting things down, and we're all like on the air going, "What the fuck is this? I've never seen this before." Now they're finally starting to let all the information out about all of the weird ballots and all the weird issues and everything else, which were basically enough to tip the scales in enough places that, you know, it, it could have changed things. And then, then everybody's like, but the court said that he that he lost. Um, have you seen what the courts are doing to this man? Do you trust them anymore? Because I don't. That, that's been my problem for a while. I was like, I get it. It's different jurisdictions all over the place. 
But if this is happening in one state, it can happen pretty much everywhere. Oh, and yeah. They are, going Definitely. At, they are going after this man with everything that they have. I mean, we're now living in an America where the left is telling you that if this man gets back into office, he's going to jail his critics. He's going to put... He's going to put journalists in jail. He's going to jail Joe Biden. And what is Joe Biden doing? <laughs> doing exactly what they're accusing Trump of doing if he becomes president. I, I don't. I just, yeah, we are a laughing stock. Stop making, I talk me, to, stop making me defend Lord Spray Tan, for God's sake. I, I, seriously, I was talking to my girlfriend in Germany, you know, via Skype, like we do some Sundays. And she asked me what was going on. And I'm like, <laughs> we let, we let okay, the inmates run the asylum for a little too long. What's going on with what exactly? And she said, with Biden, I don't understand. I'm like, he's 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 got cognitive issues. I was like, well, then why do you allow him to be be president? Why don't you remove him? I was, I was like, I can't do it. And 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 she was like, I thought the people had power. It's like, oh. You're so sweet. Okay, let me give you a rundown of what's going on. So I started telling her everything that's been going on. We have countries. We have comedians in other countries, with the exception of Germany, because Germany just doesn't do that. They don't understand humor. That are making fun of Joe Biden. Yeah, Italy for and <laughs> Italy comes to mind, but it's not just Italy. They're doing it in Argentina. They're doing it in Colombia. They're doing it in Puerto Rico, Okay. Um, that was something that my cousin told me. He was Wait, like, I can't believe it. I just saw some, I, I, Sabado Gigante, they had, they had somebody pretending to be Biden and he was like fucking up everything. And I was so like, wait, oh my Demo God, for real? Democrat and Democrat light is making fun of Biden. That's yes, kind of funny. they're making fun of him. <clears throat> and that, I'm like, kind of funny. holy shit. I mean, wow. That, you know, and like I said, Germany does, doesn't do it because... Well, uh, ger- people well, in Germany would get in big trouble. They don't really, yeah, they, they would get in trouble. Let, I mean, let's face it. There was a comedian that made fun of Erdogan, who's the Turkish president over there. The Turkish president got mad, so Germany jailed him. Not the president, but the, the comedian. And, uh, I mean, that had to go through through the Reichstag in order for him to get out of jail. <laughs> so you can imagine... Nobody wants to take the chance over in Germany, but it's it, those are not the only countries either. Well, I mean, the, funny, the funniest part for me is I don't know if it took them finding out that they were on the bubble or what happened, but last week's Saturday Night Live was fucking hilarious. Like twice, the monologue was funny as hell. I mean, it was a little, it was a little slow for me, but the, the comedian style is always slow. But he was saying things that would have gotten anybody else canceled. And then the news clip dude was making fun of Joe Biden. And I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell just happened to Saturday Night Live? I, you know, maybe they're, they're getting they're getting the uh, the memo. It's time to make fun of him so we can get rid of him. I don't know. That would make sense to me, considering. Well, I, I, if it was just that thing, I would have thought that. But the, the guy that they had doing the opening monologue this past week was a guy they let go in 2019 for saying things that were offensive to people and hurt people's feelings, and then he came out and said the exact same shit, and they were fine with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Well, you know, there, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of FAFO going around. And it's not just, you know, in California. California is just the most egregious example in our nation right now. But, I mean, look what happened oh, during okay, the, the Fannie Willis trial, you know. <laughs> Whatever it was. Oh, my God. I mean, that has just been incredible. That has, I that has just been... did not express to anybody how much of a telenovela that thing has become. And the, the worst thing is, right, and the judge at, clo- at the end of closing arguments is like, I think I have enough now and I'll have a decision in a couple of weeks. I'm like, dude, she admitted to meeting him in a cabin after she hired him. What else do you need to know? <laughs> Even if nothing else is true, take what she said to you and just say, "Yeah, no, you you shouldn't be doing this case anymore." But I, I think well, it, I there think, was a. I mean, the the, uh, the guy just had when he was running down the reasons why she, um, why this is a conflict of interest, and it wasn't it wasn't just one issue. I mean, he had like eight, you know, and he enumerated them, and he brought the law into it, and he was explaining. And he said, and this doesn't stop at at, um, at the uh, district attorney. This is her entire office because they all signed off on it. 
And, you know, I started thinking, well, if they signed off on it, they could have signed it off for two reasons. One, they agreed with her and they really are that corrupt. Or two, which is also probable, under threat of losing their job, they signed on it. I'm going to say it's probably that second one because. But that's very unlikely. I think it's the first one. Yeah, I don't think so because she's had a couple of different whistleblowers that have come out and thrown her under the bus in the last few months. Um, she was apparently not running the office in the best fashion, if you know what I mean. Um, oh no, I'm pretty sure of it. Apparently, and I haven't seen anything come out about it yet, but apparently Congress was actually questioning one of her whistleblowers the other day, and I've been waiting to see if anything ever comes out of that. But, I mean, the whole thing with me was watching the difference in the demeanor between the defense attorneys. And granted, there's like three or four of them. But they would get up and during closing and they would just list things off and list things off and list things off and list things off. And the judge would be like, okay, you got anything else? No, Your Honor, thank you for your time. And then the representative for the district attorney's office gets up and dude is sweating bullets from like, like jump. Like humming and hawing and umming and everything. And I was like, dude, somebody needs to put this poor kid out of his misery because he looks like he's more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. What the hell? And then they panned over to, to Fannie Willis at just the right time where you could just see the wheels turning. And I'm like, okay, so if she didn't do anything wrong. Why does she look like somebody ate her pet goldfish right now? I mean, I, and I, I have no illusions. I mean, the, the most that is probably going to happen is she's probably going to get a slap on the wrist from the judge. She'll be removed from the case, and then some other district attorney is probably going to have to start over with it. But I have no illusions that anything major is going to happen. I mean, that's just it, – it seems like the left is all kinds of fucking around, and there's, no, there's never really any finding out until the damage is just so bad that you can't do anything with it anymore. And that's usually when the state starts crumbling around them, um, which is happening now in California and New York. Um, I mean, and the worst thing is it's not just them anymore. Like Illinois has has just done something that was asinine, in my opinion, because the Supreme Court has already decided that they're going to decide whether individual states can remove Donald Trump from ballots based on their 14th Amendment concerns. So every state, for the most part, that has already made that decision has pretty much put anything on hold until the Supreme Court decides. Well, the district court judge in Illinois just said, no, fuck that. We're taking him off the ballot. This happened yesterday. But wow. you, know, you know why they're trying to take him off the ballot in Illinois, though? Because people in Chicago are fucking pissed. And everybody in Chicago is like, fuck it, he can't be any worse than this guy. And we knew we had money in our pocket when he was in. Let's put him back in. And that's why everybody in blue states is trying so hard to get him off the ballot. And I keep telling everybody, I said, look, I don't like the guy either. I wish, I mean, we, we should have we had DeSantis. We could have had DeSantis. He has the same teeth as Trump with none of the baggage, and it would have been absolutely amazing. But for some reason, everybody's so pissed off about everything that Donald Trump is being put through that they've decided that it's him versus Biden again. I have no control over that because I have zero say in a primary, and I do it that way on purpose because then I can yell at everybody when I feel like they're being stupid. But here, here's my thing, though. Everywhere. You see, you're seeing it now in New York City. People are, people are talking about voting for Trump. Chicago, people of color are talking about voting for Trump. Michigan, people are talking about voting for Trump. And it's not just on social media anymore. I mean, there's a guy that I, that I just saw that tried to put out a clip just to see if he could do it. He was, he was uh, and it, this was, uh, I mean, granted, this was like in Iowa or Ohio right before one of their caucuses or whatever. And so he's going around everybody wearing MAGA hats and everything. If, if, if you had the choice between a million dollars and voting for Trump, which would you take? Trump, because you, you, the shit's too broken. And he kept asking the same question over and over and over again. And everybody kept saying, ain't enough money in the world. And one lady finally just said, well, it's technically a secret ballot, so I could tell him I didn't vote for him and take the money anyway, but I'd still be voting for him. And that's probably the most, that's probably the most honest answer I heard out of everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, I better jot that down, future reference. But yeah, it, it has, it has, and now Lansing has entered the chat. They are now a sanctuary city. <laughs> and Lansing, Michigan is about just fucked around and is about to find out. That is the latest entrance 
entrance I, I, in I just, the FAFO. I just don't get it. You're seeing everything that's happening in all these sanctuary cities. You're seeing all of the residents that are pissed. I mean, and now you've got... I think, I think it, one of the reasons that Lansing, Michigan decided to do this is that they think they are well removed and they forgot that they have an airport. <laughs> and in my say. opinion, I really do think that they're trying to cater to the population there because they do tend to have a very large minority population where they're, I, I think they're miscalculating is that the minority population that's there needs the, the taxpayers to pick up their tab and they don't want that money like it's happening in Chicago to go to people who are coming illegally into the country. I mean, you have places that are giving, look at what New York is doing with the illeg illegal immigrants that they have. They're giving them EBT cards. They're putting a $1,200 on each EBT card a month, you know, for each member of the family or some ridiculous amount like that. But the people, actual citizens who are lower income are not getting that benefit. And they're angry. They're very angry because... And for once, I agree completely about this whole thing. Yeah, those are their benefits. Sure, they may be rooking the system, but by God, they're my citizens, and I will support them rooking the system over an illegal rooking the system. Because at least they do have the right to that money by, being, by virtue of citizenship. The people that are coming here don't have that. And, and, and don't even get me started with the whole... Most of them are not criminals. The moment they cross the fucking border, they're committing a crime. Don't tell me they're not criminal, and they know they are. This is this is the damnable part. If it were not criminal, why aren't they? We in Texas alone have twenty eight ports of entry where anybody can go and declare asylum. Why aren't they using them? Why do they have, why are they voting those ports of entry? Nobody ever asks that. I mean, the right asks it, but the left never answers. They always go, the, the fallback is, well, now you're just being racist. I said, I'm Hispanic. I got the badge, baby. I cannot be racist by your own definition. So tell me, why, why do they avoid the 28 ports of entry? 28. There is no reason for them to avoid it. Meanwhile, and then you have our commander in chief going over to Brownsville. Brownsville is a port of entry. They get maybe twelve people a month. On on on, and that's being generous, okay? That go through that port of entry, twelve. On average, it's more between eight and nine. Trump went to Eagle Pass. Yeah, which, and, which is a pretty hefty term. Yeah, area. that's not a legal port of entry. And that's where the majority are coming through. It is, you guys don't even know how bad it is. Pictures don't even do it justice. I am so glad that I'm no longer living near San Antonio because it has gotten very bad. My sister is seriously considering putting bars on her windows and she lives in a really nice neighborhood. We, that our neighborhood and it, we're outside of San Antonio, but it's getting that bad. And I remember going to the, um, the seedier parts of San Antonio where, you know, the good food is at, that's where I went to, you know, the Mexican food places and every single place had bars on the windows, houses and commercial buildings alike had bars on the windows. And now that shit is moving northward and people are very concerned. And they should be. We have, San Antonio boasts about being a sanctuary city, but not really because Greg Abbott actually took away money. You know, they said, if you're going to declare yourself a sanctuary city, you're not getting money from our state. You can depend on the federal money, though. So more power to you, but you're not getting any state money. And uh, so a lot of the cities rescinded that to include San Antonio. 
but they still facilitate things over there. It's a very liberal city. A lot of people don't know how liberal that place is because they, they think because it's in Texas, it's not. San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, Austin. Austin. Oh, my God. They're, they're liberal hellholes. They all are. But to give San Antonio credit, they, you know, they kind of stem a lot of the, uh, of, of the bad stuff. Unfortunately, it's, San Antonio is the first stop from Eagle Pass. That's the first major city from Eagle Pass. So there a lot of, you know, a lot of them tend to gravitate towards San Antonio. But San Antonio has very strict uh, city ordinances about tent cities and stuff like that. So they end up moving further north to Austin. And uh, Austin is unfortunately starting to come to terms with the fact that they need to start enacting city ordinances against tent cities as well. I remember driving up from um, my former house to come to see my brother and we would drive all of 35 because he's right off he was right off of 35 at the time and going through austin every underpass just a bunch of tents it was it was it was incredible to me that that was even going on but you know now it's bad here now like you know I, meanwhile i'm thinking lancy's now a sanctuary sitting a city okay greg abbott's gonna start you know Giving people, hey, this is an option. <laughs> you want to go to Lansing? Lot of just New York and uh, Chicago. Now yeah, Lansing is available too. So let's see. Let's see how long before they find out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I give it. I give it slightly longer than Martha's Vineyard, but probably not much. Yeah, Martha's Vineyard was. That was classic. That was like some record that, time bullshit there. That was 36 hours, if that. And and they made themselves the heroes for facilitating their them to leave to an army base. I was like, you you literally, you, that was not heroic. Heroic would have been opening your doors and allowing them to stay with you and 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 sticking to by what you mean by sanctuary city. You guys were up in arms because these people were not not of your caliber. <laughs> oh, and it was with great tears that we put them on the bus to go to the army base. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure it was. <laughs> After you took your pictures with everybody smiling and you feeding them, and then you shooed them away. What I think is funny is I don't even remember where it was now. I think it was like Massachusetts or somewhere. Some freaking state house person was calling for people to open their homes to migrants and then they a, a lot of people did and then the news stories started coming out about how they were having them cook and clean for them for nothing <laughs> everybody yeah like, what i was i was like that's indentured servitude <laughs> which is slightly above slavery but not by much not much and i and I, I, I was like you guys are boasting about this on social media and you think it's good dude one of them did like a, an interview with cnn and was bragging about how the 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 child of the family that's living with them now calls her her second abuela or something, and I was like, oh my, yeah. And then she's like, oh, and and she she's she's like this amazing cook, and someday she wants to open a restaurant, and she cooks dinner for us every night, and she does this and she does that, and of course they're on camera. We're just so grateful to have a place to stay that we do this because we like it here. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you've been told if you don't, they're gonna toss your ass out. Yeah, I don't I don't think this is, you know, it's not a free thing. I mean, seriously, because I remember when uh, I think I must have been about, I think I was 12, and we were visiting Puerto Rico, and there was a hurricane coming. And in Puerto Rico, people are, they react differently to hurricanes, it's almost a, you know, okay, yeah, another one's coming. Let's just say, shut they, down the windows. They probably and, react a lot like we do to tornadoes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, you know. So, <clears throat> but some of the houses that were wood instead of cement block, like most of them, you know, they suffered a lot of damage and everything. And a lot of people in town actually said, you know, 
yeah, we'll take some people in. We have two extra bedrooms or, you know, whatever. And we took them in. My grandmother, my grandmother took in uh, a couple and their, and their baby. Um, and, uh, she would not let them do anything. She said, no, you guys have suffered enough. You lost your house. Let's just get insurance started and, and all that stuff. You guys you know, take care of yourselves. Make sure that you guys are okay. My grandmother wouldn't let them do anything. And as a matter of fact, she was livid when the, the, the gal was in the kitchen and, you know, for, you know, in, in the morning and was making breakfast for everybody. She's like, you're a guest in my house. You do not do that. I mean, seriously, there's, there's just, now you can offer, please let me help you. You know, I would love to be able to repay you somehow or something, you know? And so the, the gentleman was actually, uh, helping my grandmother's garden, you know, in that because they they needed to feel needed. So I can understand that feeling to, you know, repay in kind. But to become the cook and, you know, I I just no. Who was doing the cooking beforehand? That's what I want to know. Because they have actually ceded that to the people that are now living in that house with them. And and it, it's 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 weird. That that to me it's weird. I mean, I, when I have friends visit, you know, Courtney when she comes, she would she wants to cook dinner for me to say thank you for um, me hosting her for like three or four days. And sure, okay, yeah, that would be great. And she cooks dinner for us, and it's great. It's awesome. She's a fabulous cook. I mean, it's it's great. But under no circumstances would I expect anybody to take over my kitchen duties or my laundry duties or anything like that simply because I am offering them a room while they're, you know, in my country illegally. No. <laughs> it's just it's been happening. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's a northern thing. But the thing is, the way it came across... That was indentured servitude. It really struck. It, it just did not strike me as being right. Yeah, well, Even well, the, the funny thing with me about it, though, was and I, I can't remember if it was MSNBC or CNN that did it. But I remember because I, I played I played a clip of it on the afternoon show the day the story broke. And I remember listening to this and I'm like. Dude, they're all like smiling and grinning at the newsroom about this. And I'm like, you realize we're headed. I mean, we now have people that are segregating themselves again. And now we're getting back into indentured servitude. We have gone so far backwards. And nobody nobody notices. I don't, I, I mean, the scariest thing for me is, you know, it, it's one thing to point and laugh when the left plays a game of fuck around and find out. I enjoy that. It's fun. But when the fuck around and find out starts messing with my life too, I wouldn't know one fuck around and I don't want to be the one to find out. And I'm just saying, those aren't words. I get it, but still, I went with it. <laughs> yeah, it's just, um, you know, I'm like, I'm hoping that these people. Actually, I'll take that back. I am hoping that they they find out, but. That would mean that the people that they're hosting are actually bad people. And I really don't want to think that. But, you know, the more I think about that situation, the more I'm pretty sure these people were vetted before they accepted them. Even even though um, apparently when they called and said, yeah, we'll take a family in and the family was there within an hour. But I, I think that that family was vetted before being dropped off at that that house because I, I I just I I'm trying to make it work in my head and that's the only thing that I can come up with honestly <laughs> so I kind of do want them to find out but I kind of don't because I want to believe that the family is a nice family and they really are here because they want a better life but again going back 
we are not the only ones that have a border with our southern, a southern nation. You know, we are the biggest border. You know, we have the longest border with Mexico, but we're not the only ones. And like I said, we have 28 ports of entry. Why aren't you going to one of them? And as evidenced by Brownsville, that only maybe nine or ten a month go through there, that's because asylum law is very strict. It's very definitive. These people are not seeking asylum. If they wanted asylum and if they had an issue where asylum was necessary, they would go through the ports of entry. And they're not. No, I mean... I don't remember who it was, but there was a guy on Fox News a few days ago. That was in, it was um, when the announcements were made that Biden and Trump were both going to Texas. There was a there was a Fox guy that was already down there, and he was interviewing people as they were getting off the buses and stuff, asking them where they were from, where they wanted to go, and what they planned on doing when they got there. Half of them were like, you know. Um, from and they basically named where they came from. Then he said, "Okay, so where you want to go?" And it was usually like New York or Chicago. And they, okay, what are you planning on doing when you get there? Nothing. I just want a better life. I don't want to work. Yeah, <laughs> they don't want to work. I'm serious. They they don't. They do not. And and it is it boggles the mind. When I came here in '76, I was three. I lived in an area, huh? I was three. <laughs> Shut up. Anyway, <laughs> I lived in an area <laughs> where there was a lot of um, illegal immigration that would go through. I mean, the, the borders were not as closed as they are now. But the thing was, most people went through the ports of entry at the time. It was not as difficult to come to the States as it, as it is, as it was for a time. And now it isn't, obviously. Um, but you know, the people that were coming through, they wanted to be American. They wanted to learn our customs. They wanted to learn our food. They wanted to, they wanted to learn the language. They wanted to be able to communicate. They wanted to work. They really wanted all of these things. They really believed in the American dream. And that was back when we still believed that we were a melting pot, you know, and, you know, I had to explain that concept to my, my niece because she didn't understand it. It was tragic, but whatever. It's because nobody teaches Nowadays, anything anymore. <laughs> huh? Nobody teaches anything anymore. No, they don't. And now, you know, we're at a point where we're, we're a salad bar. Everything is divided into its own. Nothing gets, you know, um, nothing, get, nothing touches anything else. You know, the, the pickles are off in one place. The olives are off in one place. The tomatoes are all over there. You know, the, the, everything's divided. There is no melting pot. Even when you make the salad, you do it in layers. And it's just, it drives me crazy. Yeah. You because. Remember, you remember back in the day when they when they used to call most Protestant churches uh, Christian cafeteria churches because you just kind of picked what you wanted and left the rest behind? I'm starting to feel like that's how our immigration policy is anymore. It's like cafeteria America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like Luby's. Oh, my. I miss Luby's. Luby's was so much fun. My grandma but used to work at Luby's. just like that. No, oh, I, I, Luby's was great. That was, that was a treat for us, you know. And, and you know, it, it, was, it was great because when Dad said we're going to Luby's, we just wanted it. Freaking jackpot because it had the strawberry shortcake and the strawberry pie and the strawberry this and the jello. Oh my god, we were we're insane. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I was a kid, it was furs because um, that that was closer. There was one like two minutes from our house, uh, but yeah, same same general concept. And I used to love yeah, the chicken yeah, fried steak. Yeah, first was good was too. Kid. I think the first furs that I went to was in San Antonio because yeah. we didn't have one in McAllen. And then they tried to do the whole furs all you can eat buffet thing instead of doing it cafeteria style. Because I mean, all furs eventually went to all you can eat. You just had to go back and get more. But then they tried to do like the whole you know buffet style. Everything just sitting right. out. You go pick it up, and that that lasted like six months before it died. <laughs> it was good for the six months it was there, but it didn't last long. For some reason, people didn't like that concept very much. No, I kind of like the cafeteria thing because you can pick yourself. 
it was cool. It was yeah. I felt so grown up with my old tray. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But yeah I, we're, I, at, I, yeah, I remember when I was a kid. Nobody wants to assimilate. We've we've been told that assimilation is racist. Yeah. We've been told that assimilation is cultural appropriation, and you shouldn't do that, which is the biggest crock of shit ever foisted on people. Oh, speaking of cultural appropriation, I got a friend of mine so bad on Facebook the other day because she did one of those AI things that says this is what you would have looked like in a past life, and she posted it, and she's like, oh, my God, I'm cross-eyed. So I commented back, my culture is not your costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh man everybody doing the ai stuff and meanwhile me i'm over here going ah, fucking skynet <laughs> Dude, not gonna lie finding that gift the other night freaked me the fuck out do i know remember the gift i put out after the show where yes. google and the robot arm comes up and erases google and writes skynet that one i'm not gonna lie that would kind of freak me out <laughs> And I, I laughed at that and I said, oh, holy shit, that is actually happening. <laughs> We're watching it in real time. But yeah, oh, I mean, man. the funny thing is that still falls into the same category of fuck around and find out because everybody's yes, ta- everybody's taken this whole, you know, it, it's all going to be okay thing with this whole artificial intelligence. And it's, it's almost like nobody pays attention to Ian Malcolm anymore. Seriously, the band was a, beyond a genius. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just thinking. Do, do you, do you really think that it, that it was a coincidence that this huge propaganda machine went live a few months before an election? Do you really think it was? Because I don't believe in coincidences. I'm just saying. I don't either. <laughs> oh man, it just, it cracks me up that everybody's like so excited about this whole AI thing, and and I'm thinking. You you get do y'all does nobody ever watch movies dooms doom movies I mean seriously like surrogates Terminator <laughs> dude I remember and I don't even remember the name of the movie but there was one that freaked me out when I was a kid and it was because it was just it was just when I started getting into computers and there was this movie where this guy got this stuff that basically the computer was able to completely like run his house for him and eventually. The computer had like a female personality, so eventually it started treating him like it, like she was his spouse, and then he started trying to date somebody, and then the house started trying to kill him. I don't even remember the name of that movie, but that movie like scared me for weeks because I was like, I don't ever. Oh hell, yeah, I, and you know what? I I can totally see this happening. I can see it happening. I'm. Well, I mean, I'm putting you out know, if, you, is, if you're, we're starting the find out phase of AI. It's yeah, just, it's about to start. Yeah, we we've done the fucking around in part. Now we've hit, now we're hitting the finding out in part. But the funny thing is, if you talk to guys that are below thirty, almost every single one of them has an app on their phone that's an AI pretend girlfriend. I really could have done without ever knowing that. <laughs> what? Yeah, look up the numbers. <laughs> There's these stupid little programs now that are supposedly AI that you, I mean, to get all the cool stuff, you have to have to subscribe, of course, which is expensive as fuck. But there's, you know, programs that you can use as your girlfriend. And then now there are people that are starting to figure out how to build animatronic bodies that they can put these personalities in. And I'm like, um, I've seen these movies. No, thank you. I've seen these movies. No, thank you. So yeah, I don't. I don't think we've. I don't think we've fully gotten into the finding out phase for this stuff yet, but we're getting close. Yeah, it's 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 starting, and I'm just like, no, 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 no. I'm just. I I'm not a big computer person. Forgive me, Jeff. I am not big into IT. I'm so sorry, Ordy. So for me, I always treat this stuff as. Um. As as a vial of typhoid or smallpox, okay, that's how I treat technology. If I'm not familiar with something, I'm not going to mess with it very much. So I tend to have an enormous respect for it, and I try to minimize. 
um, my interactions on it. Yes, I do social media, obviously. My, I can't really quit Facebook because of my family as much as I want to. And um, I could say the same thing for Twitter because of the online family that I have in, in Twitter. But as far as the interaction, you know, working in a computer with computers, you know, for a job or something like that, I couldn't do that. I, I could not do, do I, there was a time when I actually started educating myself on it and I stopped. I just, it just freaked me out. I was, I was kind of like, this is something that I have a lot of respect for because it can turn on you on a dime. So I just had to leave it alone. <laughs> Meanwhile, my dad is over there thinking, you know, maybe I'm at an age that nanobots would not be a bad idea. And I'm like, Dad, <laughs> come on. He just, he, just want, he just wants easier ways to kill people. Yeah, <laughs> the next thing I know, he's Doc Ock or something. I don't know. <laughs> I know that's not nanobots. But <laughs> uh, it depends on which version of Spider-Man you're looking at. Because, yeah, they did, they did eventually work nanobots into doc Ock. that's actually in one of the most recent oh yeah that's right yeah. yeah that's right but um you know it's just it's just for me i it, it's over there and it stays over there and you know i'm i'm a lot of people make fun of me because i'm living in such a remote area that i didn't have to do a lot of country stuff <laughs> it's like the other day, I was helping to fell a tree. Uh, I'm getting the chicken coop ready. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And it's just, there are a lot of chores that come with, you know, having acreage and, and stuff like that. And I was talking to my girlfriend who just bought a house with 10 acres over in Virginia. But the 10 acres are cleared. There are no, there's nothing on them but beautiful pasture, beautiful oh, grass. Lucky, That's lucky, it. Lucky, lucky. And I, and I, and she's like, I don't know why you work so hard. I mean, I got 10 acres, you know, and I'm looking at it going, there's not much to do. I'm like, okay, this is a list of what you're going to need. Cause I saw the pictures. It came with a barn. So I said, okay, in the barn, you might, you might decide you want a horse. Well, you're going to need all this stuff too. <laughs> so I'm detailing everything. She's like, nah, -uh. and I'm like, uh huh. She's like, well, I'm not getting a horse. <laughs> But, you know, it's a, it's, she's got beautiful, beautiful acreage, but it's very manicured. It's very pretty. It's, you know, it's not wild like what I've got out here in East Texas. So when I, I was telling her, I was like, you know, she, she pinged me on uh, Messenger and she asked what I was doing because she wanted to share pictures of her new place. And I said, I'm sorry, I was out there, you know, helping to fell a tree. And she's like, you've gone so country. I was like, it just, it was blocking the driveway. And she was like, well, how many trees do you have? So I took a picture and I sent it to her. She's like, that's your acreage? And I was like, no, that's the driveway. <laughs> My acreage is far more than this. So she was, good. She was a little stunned. But um, so it's, it's all perspective. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, it's really nice and manicured right now, but it's not going to stay that way. So she's going to, she's going to have a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> when Shoot, they I'm already out struggling with the two and a half that I have. For this. <laughs> Shoot, I'm already struggling with the two and a half that I have. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> I, yeah, I know my, one of my best friends has seven and she's like, man, I want to downsize. And I'm like, but what, what do you mean downsize? But what they did was they bought the seven acres and then they built houses in different corners for the family. So she and her husband have one, her son and his, and his uh, wife and kid have one. And then her parents have one. And so, you know, it's kind of like a little co compound. She's like, but she hates having to mow it, you know, because her parents can't do it. Her parents, son has a job her daughter-in-law has a job so it falls to her because her husband has a job even though she has a job but she's the one that with, with the riding lawnmower so um and she's like yeah i i want to sell like two or three i'm like so each house will get an acre <laughs> and she's like yeah <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so she wants to downsize too. But you know, I, I, I I'm at a, in a place where I can't really do away with any of the. I mean, I have to I have to deal with it. So I do. So you know, I I fucked around and found out <laughs> in a way. <laughs> yeah, I have a whole list of things that I want to do but, if I can ever stop. You know, having you know life changing emergencies every other week. One of the things I would love to do is put a fence up around the property so I can just get a couple of goats and not really have to worry about lawn mowing anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you know, my uh, my mother-in-law said, you need goats. And I'm like, no, I do not need goats. Oh, but they eat the grass. That's what I have. I have a lawnmower. <laughs> she just wants me to get goats. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> my property has so many trees, though, that, I mean, there's like all kinds of weedy and everything else that I need yeah. to be doing. And I was like, you know what? If I just put up a fence, I could get goats and I wouldn't have to worry about half this shit. I know, I know. Everybody, I I almost had an alpaca people. I was this I was this close. Literally have a hail of ba- a bale of hay out here just in case she came into my property. But no. She got she got rankled and I was I was I, y'all have no idea how upset about I was about this. I really looked forward to having an alpaca. You don't have an alpaca yet. She'll get out of here. Yet. <laughs> She'll get out again. I'm seriously thinking of tracking down the guy that owns them because apparently he has more than one. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I should buy one. And of course, you know, my family's all going, you don't, you, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And I'm like, I, but they're, I, so I, cute. they're so cute. Yes, they're so cute. <laughs> they tell me no. I was like, they're really low maintenance. They really are. I was surprised. They're they're very low maintenance. They're like mules. They're very low maintenance. So I was like, okay, but I also I they do need to be shed, you know, and everything. So um, I've done that, you know. I've sh- I've shorn sheep. I know how to do it. Um, I. I just wanted I, the alpaca was so cute, y'all. I mean, you saw the picture; it was adorable. <laughs> yeah, the the neighbors three or four miles to the east of me have an alpaca farm, and one of them, I swear to God, looks like Alf on four legs. <laughs> I was like, I want that one. It reminds okay. me of Alf. <laughs> Some can, you know, they all. Don't, they don't look the same. They all have very distinct facial features. I mean, it, it, it's funny, but, you know, you expect all cows to look alike, but they don't, you know. And that's another thing. If I, 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 told, the, I told the rancher, if I find another cow on my property, she's mine. And he laughed about it, and I looked at him. I said, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you don't know how close I came to keeping all four cows last time. <laughs> Let them find out. I want them. I want them to find out. But anyway, soon will be the apocalypse. <laughs> apocalypse. <laughs> but look at them. Aren't they cute? They're so cute. You know. Uh, I. That was another thing. Yes, MD. I actually toyed with the fact, that, toyed with the idea of getting an email. Uh, no. I was offered an ostrich a few years ago. I said a uh, hard pass on the ostrich because ostriches uh, get okay prickly. If if you if you get an emu, just promise me you're not going to wear both be wearing yellow shirts, please. No, okay. no, 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 no. But oh yeah, that's true. Or the emus did win a war. So, uh, but you know, I just. I would love to have some kind of animal roaming around the property doing its own thing. <laughs> low maintenance, something low maintenance, just doing its own thing. <laughs> I don't, and but the thing is, you know, we do get feral hogs here. And that, you know, when they're in season, they come through and it's like, it's a pack and they are considered a pest and they, they have to be good. I mean, seriously, it's open season on feral hogs year round here in Texas because it's so bad. Um, and when it's really bad, yeah, the pro- like I said, the, the white rule rage 
hashtag game that we were playing earlier, shooting one, and then having to process your own because all of the deer processors that are around you are so backed up with feral hogs that they have no room for you anymore. <laughs> it was like the, I couldn't even take it to the butcher. The butcher was like, "Yeah, I have, I have two dozen that I need to. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm full now. I, I won't have space for another three weeks." I'm like, oh, "I can't, just can't wait." <laughs> so, thank you, Grandma, for teaching me how to cut up a pig. <laughs> we got fresh bacon. <laughs> yeah, pork belly, but you know, just. There's there's a lot of um, finding out when you move from the city to the country. Uh, but if you lived in the country before, it just starts coming back to you. So it's, it, it's, it's been kind of cool. However, it won't be cool for some people if everything goes to hell. <laughs> I know people, I swear to God, I know people that think food comes from grocery stores to this day. They don't understand the concept of where food comes from before they go to the store. Dude, I love that in 2020. Everybody was like, I don't understand why there's no food. Why can't we just go to the grocery store? Because that's not where the food comes from, dumbass. <laughs> it's the final destination for it. But yeah, that, 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 that whole thing. There was like some blonde chick putting out videos. I don't understand why I can't find any food in my grocery store right now. Because there isn't any. But dude, I can, I can, I, I just now I have, to, now I have to, now I'm wondering what feral hog chicharrones would taste like. I'm just saying. Uh, can confirm they're pretty good. Oh, you're just rubbing it in. And, and the, I'm seriously, and the, the layer of fat is a lot thicker than a regular domesticated pig. But, you know, at, one of the reasons that we need to control the feral hog population is because of the domesticated pigs, because they can interbreed and the hogs become larger as they interbreed. It is, it is a phenomenon that is causing a lot of concern uh, here in Texas. There was, they, they, there was this one hog that was um, shot right outside of Lackland Air Force Base the golf course area. And everybody was like, how did this pig get on base? Calm down, chillax. It wasn't technically on base. It was right outside of the base by the golf course. Yes, Lackland Air Force Base has a really nice golf course because, of course, Air Force Base. And so this sucker weighed, I want to say about 600 pounds. Everybody was freaking out. The one lady was like, my God, 600? I thought... 300 pounds was bad. And people looked at her and said, what do you mean 300 pounds? And I was like, well, yeah, we, we get the 300 pounders around here all the time. <laughs> Those, they don't even blink an eye to, you know, they're like, oh, it's just 300 pounds, you know, that's standard. But this one was like massive. It was, it was huge. And so there's, that's one of the reasons why it's a year round thing here in Texas. And people, I, I know people that have come from, Kentucky, um, they've come from Minnesota, they've come from Nebraska to come down and shoot and bag some feral hogs to take back. So I was at an estate sale and one of the things that they were selling was a hog uh, uh, trap. <laughs> I could literally walk into it, y'all. It was that big. <laughs> And I walked inside the trap, and I'm like, holy crap, this is big. And the lady selling it said, have you never seen a feral hog? It's like, I have. <laughs> Just not next to me. So, anyway. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Yep, we made it again. Yay! Woo so, <laughs> after all that finding out... <laughs> Where can we find you, Rick? All right. Well, tomorrow night we'll be doing juxtaposition. I'm uh, gonna pick up with the Atlantis topic that we weren't able to do two weeks ago, so that'll be tomorrow night at 11 p.m. Eastern. Sunday night should be back with America Off Rails at 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Monday night I am off. Uh, I think. Yeah, I don't think I have anything. Uh, Tuesday night we have um, a 
panel show because it's going to be um, Super Tuesday. And then Wednesday, normal schedule, which you guys know by now. And then Thursday, we have State of the Union. So lots of interruptions this week. Lots of extra work for this guy. I don't know how I feel about that. Why, why did I sign up to make this my full-time gig again? Anyway, so when I'm not doing all that, you can find me on social media at RowdyRick73. You can find me as a contributor on the MisfitsPolitics.com website as well as the LoftusParty.com website. And swear I'm going to start writing again for Twitchy, I promise. Weird thing is I barely wrote anything last month and I made more money off the couple stories that I put out than I normally make when I write all of them. I was kind of weirded out by that. I was like, I don't understand how that happened, but whatever. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I got my laptop working again, so it should be a lot easier for me to put out content now because now I can do it pretty much no matter where I am. Because <sighs> yeah, this last month was terrible. I had meetings and stuff everywhere, so I was like, and my laptop's not working, so I can't just hook it up to my phone and write while I'm waiting on you. It sucks. But anyway, so that's most of it. You guys know where you can find me by now. Hell, I say this stuff like 20 times a week. Anyway, where can folks find you? <laughs> well, you can find me at Aggie Recon and at Aggie the Barkeep. Those are over on Twitter X. <laughs> I don't even know what to call it anymore. Shitter's <laughs> full. Uh, you can find me Tuesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern doing the Cocktail Lounge with the ever suave Brad Slager. Friday nights doing He Said, She Said, um, also at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, um, usually with you now, uh, still waiting on Mickey's uh, schedule to conform. Uh, once a month, we do Toxic Masculinity Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, and it's G, Bordy, Rick, and Andrew, and myself, plus our Babe of the Month. And Jeff and I have teamed up and now have a book podcast, the second Monday of every month. It's also at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, or as Jeff likes to call it, Aggie Time. <laughs> you too. Everybody calls it Aggie Time. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that's been adopted by the, by the entire I think crew. everybody's calling it Aggie Time now. So stay tuned for that one comes March 11th. That's our next installment. So stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. And we hope you have a great evening and have enjoyed uh, a more relaxing Friday than usual. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I'm going to go make a drink. I, I behaved and drank water during the show because I was trying to have solidarity with you, but I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs>